everybody, it's Jamie. I am joined with my friend Lolotov Cocktail, otherwise known as Lolo. And if you know Lolo on Twitch, then you've probably seen me there in chat or on his Fortress Fridays when he has me draw over there. We're loosely connecting this to art because I just want to hang out with Lolo and talk about stuff. But also Lolo occasionally is on my Twitch streams. He's usually in my chat, but we also collaborate for games like Pathologic 2 and I have no mouth and I must scream. Lolo is is my emotional support British man, <laughs> but he's also one of my best friends. He's super fun to chat with and Lolo and I were talking about pride and we were talking about our various experiences with like identity and how we have thought about our sexual orientations over time and labels and categories and all those other wonderful things and we wanted to chat together and, and have a record of it and sort of share our thoughts with you know the internet and our friendos on the internet so that you know maybe somebody could benefit from hearing these sorts of conversations because uh, young Jamie would like to hear some of the things that today Jamie has to say and I think young Lolo would have appreciated now Lolo's wisdom but yeah so lolo do you want to introduce yourself uh yeah will do um yeah my i, I go by lolotov cocktail on uh, on twitch most people shortened it to lolo it just seemed like an easy uh abbreviation my my real name is out there but honestly like most of my friends these days know me by my twitch handle much like how mm -hmm. i i know most of them by theirs I have apparently been streaming for about two years now. It really came about from a desire to connect with people. Okay, I saw some other streamers doing, doing, doing the streaming thing that they do, and uh, and, and honestly, like the donations and everything, like they look cool and everything. But but more, it was just the the fact that they get to own that space. They get to have their audience to do their things, like connect to people and share. The, the moments that, that they feel passionate about. And I've always been passionate about video games, even when basically no one else around me was. And so, like, being able to reach out and find other people that that love it as much as I do, that was... I, I wish I could have been able to do that when I was growing up. When when I was younger, I I always looked up to, to other content creators that were on YouTube, even though I had no idea how to do that mm. stuff. Um, I found Jamie through... The, the audience of a Twitch streamer called Mickey Ran, which many of you who know Jamie will probably know Mickey as well. Yeah, she she kind of offered me a chance to be in some of those like streams when we like played games together, when when she did some of her like earliest twelve hour like marathons. I had like thrown game suggestions out and was there to do like voices for things like Undertale and being in on that kind of by proxy was what really like got me to to start like winding my way into like winding up the courage to to start streaming myself and then uh Jamie was basically my first subscriber and, and like helped me kind of get through that first rough really <laughs> awkward finding your feet phase and yeah we, we kind of became really good friends during that time and, and yeah I think I was drawn to Lolo as a twitch streamer and like as a person because we end up being like kindred spirits along with Mickey in terms of like the way that we approach our streaming is very um, mental health centered fostering communities that are accepting and where we think critically about the words that we use and how we treat other people and owning our mistakes because we are all problematic and you know, um, the the way that you handle your problematic behavior is ultimately the the way that you measure a character. We do this on Twitch all the time, where we're just like, oh, you know, dumb, dumb, shooty things, poop joke. Also, let's talk about identity and ways that we constitute our constructed reality and also language. And talk shit about Ben Shapiro. Yeah, I love talking shit about Ben Shapiro. So it is Pride Month and Lowell and I were talking about our, our identities and ways that we 
came to discover that we were not straight and ways that gender has affected our process of coming out to ourselves and to others. And uh, I thought it was only appropriate that we sort of share those experiences and conversate and then subject other people to our conversating. So uh, since you are my guest, Lolo, I was wondering if you would go first and talk about uh, how you identify in this lovely Pride Month. Sure, thank you. When it comes to the identification on on the axes of uh, cis to trans to non-binary to all of that, I, I still feel like uh, cisgender fits me the best. I don't feel like I have any problem, like, dipping in and out uh, of the the rigid like gender roles that have uh society has kind of put us into i i i do identify as a as a cis man lolo is super confident in his masculinity in that he wears cat ears on stream if you don't know lolo pink light up cat ears nonetheless that do rainbow colors uh when when you follow and shit yeah honestly um yeah it's it's not always been that way uh it, like my my security in that was also tied up with a lot of the other stuff that we're going to discuss but really i i kind of i came to the conclusion that uh if like wearing pink stuff and like slapping like a face mask on yourself to do like some some mud therapy with with the wife and her lady friend like if if that makes you less of a man then you weren't much of a man to begin with. And to, to which identities do you find yourself attracted to? I've had relationships with mostly cis women, to my knowledge. And then the the first uh, the first man that I ever really kind of dated was a was a trans man. Uh, mm -hmm. And and yeah, when I when I first saw him, I, I there was no doubt in my mind. I looked at him and I was like. Yeah, that's that's a man right there. Yeah, I, that was never hmm. that was never a problem for me. Uh, yeah, and one of the, like one of the things that he said was like one of the things that will be good like if we if we're gonna go into this is if you is if you treat me you know like a man and I'm, I'm like that was that was always the thing I was gonna do you know you you say right, you, right. you say you're a man you're a man like I've got no problem with that. And they they did not they hadn't had any kind of um, like bottom surgery. Uh, I, I think bottom surgery is still the correct terminology. Uh, mm, or like gender confirmation, if that is the yeah the thing that confirms it for you. Right. Yeah. They like or gender is it confirmation or affirmation? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, they they hadn't had any any kind of surgery to uh, to allow to to make sure to uh, to enforce the the gender that they uh, identified with rather than the one that they've been assigned mm. at birth. So right, right, right. Um, so, yeah, so that so they still had like a a vagina and and honestly, like it it was different. But it, I I was still like, yep, yeah, this this is a man. That I that I'm involved mm. with right now. Um. So like, um, so I, I love that Lolo in in these types of conversations just goes like past the the obvious. Like when I say how do you identify, like we go into these like rich conversations about gender identity and about um, sort of how we see others in relation to gender, but to simplify mm -hmm. if you had to put on like my space right what would you what would you pick if you had to like simplify um and then sort of expand upon that i think i would probably say like cisgender bisexual because whilst yeah. i've i've had okay. people say like uh like I've, I've had someone one of my friends tell me that like having like relations with a uh, a trans man makes you uh, makes you pansexual. I I don't know if I feel like claiming that particular label. Uh, I it, I mm -hmm. I don't know if it suits me. Um, right, and especially when you're saying like I felt like I was having sex with a man, or I was having a relationship with a man, because the sex part doesn't necessarily <laughs> like define the experience of you know or a relationship. Having <laughs> Yeah, yeah, obviously. So, like, if you don't see them as any different from a man, like, why why do you need to have a conversation about, like, um, 
I also, you know, like to date trans people. Like, I, I feel like yeah. there's been a stereotype of like people who are bi and like spoiler, I'm I'm identifying as bisexual as well. But um, this feeling that if you identify as bi, you're immediately transphobic because you're saying I would date cis men and cis women, but not trans people. And it's like, for me, I like bi as a um, identification because that is an identity that has been cut out or is continually erased or made invalid if you find yourself in a straight passing relationship and Lolo and I spoiler both find ourselves in straight passing relationships yes and that that's definitely something that uh, that we want to discuss uh, at some point mm -hmm. so like um, can you hmm where do we go from here? Because talking about your identity, is there anything else that you wanted to say sort of about the the bi label before we get into like how you realize that that you identified as such a thing? I I I think that I think that we've covered most of the stuff that okay. to like to start off with before we like really <laughs> get into it. All right. Uh, well, in, in typical podcasty fashion, I will uh, attempt to um, answer the same question that I just handed to Lolo as a good sport. Um, also, I'm a tutor online for writing, and I've been having my students do assignments that I also do along with them. So I feel like I'm doing the same thing right now. Like, we're going to do a word dump together. I'll do it with you. I'll see you in 10 minutes, and we'll talk about what we did. Nice. <laughs> um, but if I'm going to subject you to an assignment, I will subject myself to it is essentially the, the pedagogy there. I respect uh, it. But, yes, so, um, because Lolo shared that he identifies, um, you know, in, in such ways as you can identify solidly in a, in identity categories that are always, like, socially constructed and, like, in flux and stuff, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, so I identify, since Lolo started with gender, um, I identify primarily uh, as a lady. Uh, I'm okay with they, them pronouns. I'm okay with he, him pronouns to a, an extent where I'm just like, you know, if a dude looks like this, like, good on him. Like, if a dude is existing in this way, like, good for him. Um, one time I was at a an event. It was a Harry and the Potters concert. Um, and someone, like, confidently called me a dude like said he and I, I was wearing like short shorts and a Hufflepuff t-shirt and you know I was like you know if a dude is this confident to wear what I'm wearing right now like good for him <laughs> nice because I have short hair and like you know I I've been told since I was a kid that I looked like a dude so you know and I used to take that as an insult I'm a girl you know you feel slighted for it but uh, you just get to a point, I think, with a certain amount of age and experience where you, you stop caring. Um, but at the same time, like, I was at no risk for violent action, I think. There's something to be said about, like, Lolo and I possessing a certain level of privilege for being white. Spoiler, being, being a podcasty thing, you hear our voices, but hello, we're white. So we have a certain amount of security in that um that like we we can feel safe talking about these things where we are in this setting online which is great and i'm super grateful for that but with that said i identify as a, a cis lady and, and as as a bisexual lady and i i don't hate trans people and i would totally hate a trans person on whatever end of the spectrum uh, it seems weird to me to not want to date someone because of their genitals which it it kind of seems like that would be the case because like there are so many different kinds of trans people it's like saying i don't like tv mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> you know no you just don't like that one show so but the same could be said about saying like, oh, I, I, I'm not into dudes. Well, have you met the right dude? That's why have super you straight met... is bullshit. <laughs> right, right. Like, who's the dude that like, have you met Henry Cavill building a PC? Like, <laughs> 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 you 
yeah, I guess that's that's how I identify um, the long and short before we get into the I don't know the the various amount of revelations you have to have before you start changing your orientation on social media. So Lolo, um, what was your process of realizing you are not straight and can you tell us about your coming out story and or the various amount of coming outs that one has to have in life because you come out to every single person you tell. Oh yeah, it, it was definitely not like an all at once thing. There, there was there were definitely like several moments of like of admitting to other people but also to myself. I think one of the first formative moments that I like, experienced any kind of same sex attraction was you know, back on uh, Gaia Online. One of you know, a <laughs> that that old cesspit. It's a uh, well. It, it was definitely a different place now to to then to what it is now. But yeah, it was uh, microtransactions. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, like uh, essentially, like Gaia was Neopets for teenagers and young adults. Um, in in the like heyday of Neopets because I remember when I I kind of aged out of being a troll on Neopets and went over to Gaia. God, I remember was Neopets like, too, yeah. Amazing. Except, except <laughs> the dumb animal you took care of was your avatar. Yeah, but you had a real avatar and you could get little pets for your avatar in Gaia. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so yeah, like one of the, the the first things that I remember seeing is like somebody had a signature on all the the posts that, that they made. You know, back when having like an interesting signature was like the thing that like that that was like the extra thing that made you stand out on the forums is like having a mm -hmm. signature that was like profound or like interesting or like personalized and the the first people showing off their like. Uh, they're like early 2000s Photoshop skills with all the mm -hmm. layers and shit and like that that was that was what marked you out as like someone who was distinguished and then like <laughs> people had um, you know people could put images and like gifts of all sorts into their signatures like th this guy had like a a signature that had like 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 a, a gif of like a pair of Asian like boys like teenagers like kissing they could have been adults for all i know so like and like hentai and yaoi were like huge uh, were huge at the time but still remain huge right but it was like it was a a new flavor that no one had really tasted before mm -hmm. uh and, mm -hmm. and so yeah it was like yeah a pair of these like two like asian uh, masculine seeming people making out and I made a uh, a comment about how the the two girls looked like really pretty and like someone uh, said yeah, no those, those two are dudes and I'm like wait what? And oh okay so that wasn't like intentionally like insulting their masculinity that was literally like I, I genuinely thought those were two women kissing because well like two women kissing is, is pretty fetishized. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say accepted. It's fetishized. Right. Uh, so I, uh, I, I basically did the uh, the reaction of like the blonde lady who's got all the equations like going on in their head. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like that. That was yes. that was essentially me. Um, I was like, what? What? What the hell is this? Uh, and I, for a while, like, st like interacted with like a bunch of dudes and like did little like RPs and stuff. Um, you know, with, with that, with 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 ladies, with dudes, um, and mm -hmm. and honestly, like, I didn't really think about it actively. I didn't really reflect mm. on what any of it meant. Um, but then, yeah, after I had had time to. Uh, process it i guess i ha i hadn't really come to a formative like thought about uh, about what it all meant until like later on in college when um i i had moved like uh, i didn't really know anyone in college and that was kind of a good thing because uh in secondary school i i, I had been bullied a lot and i was finally out in a place where i didn't know any of those 
those bullies really, or I didn't really have to interact with any of them. Uh, but I was definitely still uh, reeling psychologically from uh, f from those experiences, and also uh, another one that uh, that we'll definitely bring up later. Um, and we I was on like a different forum. Uh, we were, you know, it was more politically minded. And one of the things that came up was the idea of um, uh, marriage equality, which was just called gay marriage back then, because uh, it wasn't a thing yet. It's kind of crazy to think that uh, that it wasn't a thing uh, looking back now. But but yeah, at, at that point, marriage equality wasn't yet a fully formed uh, legality, uh, either in the UK or the US. And that the, the I, I get I got to observe all these different debates going back and forth, and obviously it was, there were different sides you could take and like different people to agree with. And as someone who hadn't really fully finished forming those opinions, I think there was part of me that just wanted to be accepted, to be in the in group for once. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I remember making a conscious decision to side with the, the more conservative people because those were some of the people that I already knew. And... Oh yeah, to be against marriage equality? Yes. And so I, 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 I said a whole bunch of like homophobic stuff that in, if I could go back now, I would definitely not have said. Mm -hmm. It for but it and it was for the sake of being in with that group. There, there's a whole lot of uh, people now who talk about how they fell down the alt right pipeline, and there wasn't that term was not there at the time. But yeah, I I wanted to be accepted by a group of people, and so that's why I ended up falling in with those people, which is kind of crazy now thinking back on it, just like picking a, a position to stand in just because of the other people that you agree with because you don't want them to to think less of you right and it's like how to, to lose friends without really trying right sharing your honest opinion great now i have to find new friends pretty much and i i remember at the time like seeing some of the stuff that they said because some of them were we would define them now as nazis um uh, and I, because a lot of them were saying some white nationalist bullshit, and I and I said to myself, like, God, no, I don't agree with any of this stuff. This sounds crazy, but you know, this other stuff on gay marriage sounds acceptable. Um, but at the time, I don't even think I really a hundred percent believed it. And at the time, I started like creating alt accounts to to explore some of the the other ideas, and and just like saw the the venom. With which the these these alt right people targeted towards these alts, and I was uh, in my head, I was like, "Well, nope, guess I can't can't explore these ideas." And so that continued for like for like a couple of years uh, until the the person that I'd first met on guy who is now my wife, my wife, my wife, uh, and like one of my uh, one of my exes who is now who I'm now good friends with, you know, they they told me that they were bi. And that mm. that um, at that point, I had I had talked about it to to them a little bit, but then I was actually forced to confront the beliefs that I had been ascribing to. And you know, the the you know, this this person was here. Yeah, you know, she was she is human. She has yeah you know, she she does all the the same things that I do. And like nothing really kills alt-right beliefs quicker than exposure to reality and, uh, and empathy. Mm, so you mean like meeting a bisexual person, you're like, this person isn't the source of sin and damnation. Yeah, exactly. Um, great, I like this person. Yeah, exactly. It's like um, my dad, who is a Trump supporter, continues to, to s say conservative things, listen to Sean Hannity, Oof. that sort of thing. He still has sympathy and has... a. Uh, a certain flavor and amount of rage um, for homophobic actions taken against one of my closest friends mm -hmm. whom my parents would have adopted um, when I was younger if they were able to do so wow. um, because they were so close to my family. Like, this guy, he was um, 
one of my closest friends when I was a kid and he came out later closer to college when he had moved away mm -hmm. and I confided in my dad about all the terrible things that had happened to him because of um, being gay especially from his mother and the rest of his family all of whom were my friends like my best friend growing up um, ended up being homophobic towards him and, and feeling a certain way about it and ostracizing him. Um, and my dad was furious about it all, even though, again, he voted Trump. Um, and one time I confronted him and said, like, what's your problem with gay people? And he said, oh, well, I just think it's icky. Um, At least that's honest. And here... Hearing a grown ass man say that his biggest problem is that it is icky to explain his <laughs> prejudice. <laughs> yeah. It, what? <laughs> and and now like I, I I think that he has expanded his horizons and he is learning. But again, I don't expect him to be holding like a Hillary sign anytime soon or a Biden sign. And you know, again, he still plays. Sean Hannity and his radio and I think it's because he needs to feel smart and he needs to feel like he has a community and without a certain amount of education and resources this is a man who doesn't know how to use the internet and a man who only graduated high school many years ago he's 70 years old like it's still not an excuse for being prejudiced but you can see where you, you take smaller steps to lead to mm -hmm. The, the greater good here. I th um, I think one of the uh, yeah. I think one of the other things that once you're that deep in, the one of the things that stops you from changing your opinion is is if you do, then you're essentially admitting that you were wrong and that you were you had always been wrong. Oh God! And imagine that sort of identity crisis of like, wow, I've been alive seventy years, and I've been taught for seventy years that this is the thing. And oh God, I have to confront the fact that I have hurt people, mm -hmm. and I have believed things like this for so long that I now have to forsake everything that I trusted before this, and that I believed in, and that I thought like was going to benefit me, like people that believe in like a, a government that cares about them and mm -hmm. that uh you know all these other things um it, it's scary it is and and i think that's that's part of what kept me from from admitting to myself where i was uh is yeah like thinking that yeah i, I would have to admit that i was wrong and that i had heard i had said and done things to people that that were objectively bad um, mm -hmm. fuck. Uh, so yeah, uh, that, that, that did definitely keep me from that for quite a while. Um, shit, what else was I going to say? Um, but so you were, you met your wife, mm -hmm. your now wife, um, and you had this, um, conservative friend group and how did you find your way out? Did you just like stop talking to them? Uh, it, it was a it was a drawn out process. Uh, I, mm. I think part of it was was figuring out that there were other places that I could go. Mm. The because like when when you're that young and you've spent like maybe one or two years in in that group, uh, the idea of like forming a new friend group is um, is like unthinkable almost. Because it's like, mm -hmm. it represents a greater fraction of your life than anything up until that point. But but when I found other places to hang out where people didn't know what I had originally been, uh, that yeah. that I think made it easier to disconnect and like reinvent myself and allow myself to kind of come to terms more with uh, with some of the stuff that I had initially experienced. Right, right. And I, I think, like, there's something to be said about being a friend to someone who thinks things um, that are different than you. I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, becoming friends with people who don't think that you deserve to live because that's a mood. Yeah. But, like, if we talk about, like, ways that, that white people can be allies um, to people of color, um, people different from themselves people who have less privilege like people in privileged positions can step in and say like 
we think differently. Like, how can I be a friend to you and how can we connect? And like giving someone a friend Mm -hmm. that can not try to change them entirely, but can see the good in them and then be like a resource where they say, well, if I, if I leave my beliefs behind, I'm going to lose a lot, but what do I gain? And I'm not going to be alone. Like that feels like such a, a freeing sentiment. It's a hopeful one, but like, yeah. I like to think that being there for someone and saying like, I'm willing to have these like hard discussions and see what we have in common and wherever we end up is where we end up. Like you may decide that I'm not worth your time because that's the people you hang out with or you might decide that I'm worth your time and you you would rather hang out with me than hate things all the time and you know in, in Dalek fashion want to like exterminate and such right um i remember having that so, conservative mindset and thinking that it was it was very freeing it was it was very it was like a, it's a simple black and white uh point of view like these people are good these people are bad and you don't have to you don't have to examine your beliefs. You don't have to think about your know, whether or not uh, your know, whether or, whether or not the the enemy has has anything worthwhile to say. You can engage in those mm-hmm. comfortable thought terminating cliches and just uh, and, and just kind of say to yourself that that they don't have anything uh, useful to say, and that you're just going to corrupt yourself by exposing yourself to them and Mm -hmm. and yeah uh it's a it's a comfortable place to exist in and but like if you really want to fuck with a conservative like be nice to them yeah if you feel safe enough to do so if you really want to change someone's beliefs and you have the privilege to step forward and like have a meal with them or like chat with them that's the way to fuck with them like you want to make a difference like it's not violence i think i mean sometimes it's violence right like well let's talk about that for a second like i mean martin luther king's like let's do peaceful protests but also when shit gets real like shit gets real they, they like to right, pretend right, right. that he was all like super pacifist but no he like pe- yeah, peace, yeah, yeah. peaceful does not mean defenseless exactly but like shit i mean like you could consider kindness a form of like intellectual non-violent disruption of prejudiced thoughts in in the sense of destabilizing mm-hmm. the uncritical assumptions of a group of people like it my dad can call me a crazy liberal all he wants but i know at the end of the day and he has said this to me mm-hmm. multiple times like he's like you're my child like i just want to feel smart sometimes I just want to feel right sometimes. And like, I know that to be true about like a conservative belief system that oversimplifies and says like, I don't need to do research about things to know. Like I can just feel it. Yeah. I I Um, agree. That's, that's definitely a lot of what I ended up feeling. And there, there's something to be said about um, people who are liberal leaning that are constantly like throwing facts down and then like insulting people for being stupid and and being told that you're stupid when you're already insecure about not having the resources for education or whatever Mm -hmm. that's hard and you're not going to change any minds shitting on people i think right and i I know we like to sometimes shit on the people who uh who post the uh the 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 grifty youtube videos about why i left the left but like to some extent it can be true yeah Mm -hmm. they'll they'll say well i i was never made as much fun of than when i expressed conservative beliefs but then i went over to you know this trump rally or, or this kkk meeting and they welcomed me with open arms and yeah like there's definitely something to be said for being welcoming to uh to people who hold those beliefs if uh, if you think mm-hmm. that they are capable of change i i and, I, yeah. I have to believe that because i was once one of them exactly and i really appreciate you sharing that part of 
your story. I mean, you have a variety of stories. One time I was checking out a copy of Fun Ho, if you've heard of that graphic novel. Um, of course, I'm gonna be in that position where I forget. Alison Bechtel. Alison Bechtel is the author of Fun Home. There we go. I didn't even have to Google it. Alison Bechtel. Be Alison Be Bechtel. Bechtel of, um, of the Bechtel test? Of the Bechtel test. Ah, okay. Uh, when I was checking it out at the library, it was my first, I think, couple weeks at grad school for my master's degree. There was this moment where I was checking out and this guy uh, is ringing up my book and he says, oh, Fun Home, what's this about? And I was like, the lesbian experience. <laughs> and like, that, that was my like, the first thing I said was the lesbian experience. And he goes, oh, how singular. Huh. And I was like, like <laughs> Okay. Um, this dude just destroyed my entire perception of, you know, I thought I was so smart. Here I was, I was just, I'm, I was so progressive, you know. I'm, I'm coming to grad school. I was just accepted into an MA, PhD program, and I'm, you know, recently identifying as, as a bisexual woman, and I know shit, and I am picking out this book that's going to affirm my thoughts and change my emotions, and I just show up and say the lesbian experience in the most uncritical way when my job is to think about language. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> Oh, how singular. In three words, <laughs> he destroyed me. <laughs> um, and it was so good because I was like, oh, yeah, everybody has a different experience. And, and somehow we end up here talking about it. But so how did you realize you were attracted to to the men folk if you grew up being attracted to, to the feminine folk? There was definitely like after the the admitting to myself that like I was in, in the homophobic crowd just to, to be in part of a crowd. There, there were a few years where I I started mentally kind of prodding at that, like, wound in my mind, I guess. And, like, oh, there's pain there. I'm not going to examine that too closely. And just, like, over time, I would start um, s slowly, like, asking myself questions uh, about, like, ab about, like, impulse thoughts that my that my brain would occasionally throw out and it was like slowly then that I began like accepting that okay maybe I do have this attraction and it's but it's not really something that I need to think about because I am in this relationship with with my uh, at the time is either girlfriend or fiance so I don't really need to think about it so yeah, like d many many years later, uh, you know, out here in in North Dakota is where I really started uh, looking at that. Once we started, also to to quickly clarify, that is not a North Dakota accent you detect in in one Lolo. No, uh, I I am. <laughs> oh oh oh, jeez, <laughs> you betcha. It's so cold up here. Go Vikings. <laughs> or something <laughs> uh but yeah i, I moved out here uh and and actually kind of when when i was living in pennsylvania uh we had like a group of friends and uh one of them was like the most openly gay like openly leftist person that that i'd ever seen and and he often was he often like said stuff that kind of made me examine some of the beliefs that i had and like some things that i thought were like haha funny jokes like the r word or whatever you know um mm -hmm. he, he like without saying them i i yeah he, he would he would definitely like confront uh what a lot of people would laugh at if he didn't if he couldn't accept it and i started thinking to myself like uh i found myself thinking in like off moments when when he wasn't around like what what would he think if i mentioned this like what what would his opinion be of this thing like would he say that it's problematic and, and and I guess that was like some sort of like latent like some some deeply hidden like attraction stuff there and like we we would occasionally like say flirty things and and he would think I was joking and and my wife would think I was joking hell on some level I probably thought I was joking but but mm -hmm. yeah, the, the more we went into it and like the more we like explored like the poly side of our relationship, I kind of looked back and I was like, 
damn, I don't think I was joking. And and that that was when I kind of DM'd him, uh, and and we kind of talked about it a bit, and and he he definitely expressed regret at not having t at, at the at not realizing that 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 I wasn't joking. Uh, and yeah, we 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 kind of talked about that for a while, um, among other things that I won't go into. Uh, but then, <laughs> but but then, what, one thing that I kind of brought up uh, because I'm pretty sure it was like a pride thing at that point as well. Uh, I told him that I didn't feel like I I had ever like even after I had come out. Uh, to my parents, like, I didn't feel part of the LGBT plus community, um, mm -hmm. and that's that's what I I actually I, so, sometimes I like the idea of like the GSRM as being a, an acceptable acronym because it's it still remains four characters no matter how many extra people are added to it. So it and what's GSRM for people that don't know? It stands for Gender, Sexual, and Romantic Minorities. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, I, I like it because it still includes everyone. It leaves, uh, it'll in, it will always include everyone, and it doesn't uh, fall into the, the trap of ever expanding. And like the conservatives talking about, oh, the alphabet people, the, the, the A, B, C, D, whatever, you're know, making <laughs> bullshit. And, and so, yeah, I, it's, it's short, it's snappy, and it still includes everyone. So yeah, that's why I like that. But yeah, I, I told him I didn't feel like I was part of that community because I had never uh, suffered any of the oppression. Uh, mm. And he said to me that, "Well, you did. Uh, you were just kind of you were doing it to yourself." And I thought uh, I was just like, "Damn, yeah, I was." Uh, because every time I said one of those kind of homophobic comments, I was crushing the, the the baby gay inside of me that that could have been the like the baby bisexual and oh, t yeah. telling telling myself that it would that that I, that, I, that that was not a good thing to be uh, mm -hmm. yeah I, I and yeah and, and yeah that that was kind of a point where I, where I thought to myself damn yeah you're right and and that was that was kind of a, a big formative moment like a year or two ago. Um, yeah, and, and like one of the things that had definitely contributed towards that homophobic phase was something that happened to me right before I um, right before I started secondary school. Uh, let me see mm -hmm. how old is year seven secondary school? Because this is uh, like so old now that like I barely even remember it. Um, so I would have been either 12 or 13, probably 12. Um, and like, before before we go into this, like, uh, content warning, trigger warning for sexual assault. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know anyone at this, uh, at this secondary school. Um, and, and so pretty much, uh, be before we actually started there, uh, at, with our first term, there was a kind of a retreat to a to like a manor, like out in the country, uh, which makes it sound the most British retreat of all right? time. It makes it sound a lot more posh than it was. But it was it was <laughs> it was paid for by the school, and and it was basically like I they, I guess they had an agreement with them. It was like hey, like come to this place, like get to know the the people that you're going to be spending the next few years in classes with uh, that sort of thing and uh, like I didn't know anyone and uh, it, it was a pretty terrifying experience in some ways uh, like I, I was one of the biggest kids in, in my primary school and I kind of uh, pictured myself as like a defender of the defenseless uh, I, I hated mm. I hated bullying and I stood up to to bullies when I had the chance which kind of you know, but that was before the homophobic phase um, and I, mm. I just kind of yeah, but yeah um, so when I when I went to that place there was um, it was one of the first nights and I I had uh, you know, 
I, I was like rooming with like somebody who I had kind of attached to for like in the name of like friendship and safety we kind of shared some uh, interests I guess and you know like we both liked video games but he was like a really big guy uh, and so like I, I guess in some ways it was also for safety because back then it was not acceptable to be a nerd uh, it, mm -hmm. it was a it was very much a, a source of being a pariah so uh, so what happened there uh, like we were going back to here to the room that we were sharing and a a guy came out of his room uh, not the room that we were sharing but yeah the guy came uh, a guy came out of a, uh, one of the the bedrooms and uh, like it's so long ago that like a lot of it was is very blurry now and there's no way that I could ever uh, convict anyone with this kind of knowledge now but he he basically he said that he was going to fuck me and he like reached out to like grab me and like grab my my wrist and the the other guys that I, I was with were walking into our room they kind of jokingly like pushed me towards him and I oh. and I panicked and like tried to pull away I I honestly looking back I don't know if if it was a joke I don't know if it was real I don't know if they thought it was a joke I don't know mm -hmm. I don't know how all real it was but it was a formative moment even if I don't really fully remember it I, I feel I feel like it must have been part of the reason that in addition to that uh, wanting to belong that I in some way looked back on the panic that I felt and and that powerlessness and that feeling of wanting to flash back and call people degenerates and, and say they were going to hell and stuff is as I would look back on that and and associate it with that feeling of defenselessness. Right, and like if we make people into monsters, um, it, it's really easy to, what's the word I'm looking for, or the phrase I'm looking for, um, many people of color are like this, stereotype is that like black men are voracious and violent mm -hmm. and you know it, um it's it's, the, like, it's easy to violent sexuality empathy. yeah or like you're afraid that like a gay man's gonna flirt with you if you're straight like that it's this sort of like fear of violation and what's interesting mm -hmm. is like i mean a similar thing with like assault um in terms of content warning but when um, when I was in high school, we had our marching band room and there was a mini room in the back and it was for the low brass section. And everyone knew that if you were in low brass and you were a dude, they were gonna take you back there and people were gonna like viciously hump you and they'd call it pizza. So they'd say, we're gonna pizza you. And this would only happen to dudes um, I think it was low brass and um, regular brass. I'm not sure. Um, I know that brass and low brass had the tradition of nutting people's instruments as well, taking your mouthpiece and sticking it in your, um, someone else's pants. Oh. Um, so marching band's a big mood. Um, so even on our senior year t-shirt, which like I designed the artwork on it, but um, the one of the inside jokes that was on the back alongside the, you know, um, different fond memories we had in marching band. Um, mm -hmm. One of the phrases in the back was, if someone asks if you want pizza, just say no. Oh, wow. Yeah, so like pizza was someone dragging you against your will into a room if you were a dude and getting viciously humped Jesus. by a bunch of like sweaty band people. Um, and could be any time. Um, and I, I'd be curious to talk to some of my um, fellow marching band members um, about 
that experience in retrospect because a lot of things were like normalized back then. Like we were in small town, North Carolina. So I, I think a lot of us didn't know better. Yeah. Um, to, to give a benefit of the doubt, like I think we thought it was all in good fun. Um, we knew it was hazing, but I, I don't know if any of us thought about it in like the, the sexual harassment kind of way. I know that nutting was something that I thought was gross and wrong, but I didn't necessarily see the like uh, the homophobia of it all. Right. <laughs> um, and like the the social relationships between men are really interesting because you have that jokey like um, men flirting with each other in some ways to say, oh, I'm not gay. I'm so not gay that I can joke about being gay with my friends. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I remember, like, being back in, like, the Scouts. And, like, when we were... When we were kids, like, we... Uh, got, like... like yeah, the, the kids... Yeah, when, when everyone thought that, like, everyone else was, like, asleep, they, they would just be, oh, yeah, like... Like I I I'm like brave enough to like show my dick to everyone, and right, right, yeah, right. And it's like um I would rather not see your dick, sir. Right, that makes me uncomfortable. And, and it's like, <laughs> it's just, right, but it's, it's like oh what are you are you a coward? Are you, are you too afraid to show your dick to everyone? And it's just like why why did we? No one questioned it at the time because we're all like really fucking young, and uh, like who it's like who first came up with that? Who who said that that or, like, was the dude's thing? Like dudes drawing dicks on everything. Yeah. <laughs> like the like um, the the phallogocentrism of it all. Like if you don't know, um, that that sort of very pretentious school of thought. But like everything is a dick. Phallogocentrism. It's like your shampoo bottle. What is it shaped like? Penis. Right. But what is every tower shaped like? Penis. <laughs> and and yet look, the the vagina is basically. The cannabis. <laughs> Every hole. It's but the but the <laughs> vaginas are the cannabis of like reality, um, of like societal viewing because, uh, and, and dicks are basically the the alcohol, because alcohol okay. alcohol is like firmly rooted in our life as something that is normal, uh, part of everyday life is associated like everywhere, and is often seen as like humorous or funny because like we you know you see. You see alcohol everywhere. You see it in uh, advertisements. You see it on TV. You see it in billboards. You see it. Um, you see drunk people on TV, even in like kids shows, and they're like, ah, ha ha. You know, the the person is drunk. It's funny. But someone who's high, no, someone who's high is like someone who is like to cry for help. You know, someone who is yeah. You don't talk about drugs. Oh yeah. You don't talk about. You know, cannabis in the same way as you talk about alcohol, and and I feel like I feel like vaginas are basically the same way. Yeah, you know, they they are seen as like somewhat less socially acceptable to talk about, even though roughly like fifty something percent of people have one. Um, th- and they, we all have them they, in the womb. Yes. Um, because remember, let's all remember for a second. Well, actually, not all of us have them in the womb, but everyone is female until you know a certain point in the development of the um, the, the fetus, as it were. Yes. I know that we all have nipples, um, and every nipple is a female presenting nipple fight me <laughs> like yeah i'm, I'm gonna fight that until i'm dead I, but I agree. Um, um everyone is female until proven otherwise in the womb right um but, but dicks are humorous like d- dicks have had that kind of cultural um head start uh to the, yeah, yeah like dicks are funny like even even the kids like in some in some respects they are seen as being like hilarious and yeah, you know, like teeth. right, and then this like vagina thing is a. Uh, an, I mean, even when we fetishize lesbians, it's never going down on a woman. It's women kissing, right? And, and like the or or scissoring, which like nobody fucking scissors. Like, right. <laughs> who has ever scissored in life? <laughs> I I'm gonna get tons of comments underneath that are like, I I belong to the scissoring organization of America <laughs> and we demand more scissoring representation as an activity. It's now a sport. What? And 
Oh, the national scissoring team for the Olympics. <laughs> so, so definitely something. I want to become a professional scissorer. I, yeah, something that yeah, tra trans men can definitely be in that sport. <laughs> that that. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Uh, fuck. Uh, well, but yeah. Um, but vaginas are seen as this like eldritch cave of mystery that like no one knows anything about and it's just like <laughs> oh, women so mysterious right. well, if you just talk to them what how does a period work can't they just hold it in uh oh yeah like, uh i remember in high school i mentioned my period to my boyfriend at the time and uh, we were all on Xbox Live, and of course I was like the one girl who was allowed in the friend group to play video games or whatever. So we're playing like Gears of War or something together, like masculinity incarnate. Um, Tits will get the fuck and out. And I say something. Whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I should have been playing like Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball or something, or like Barbie uh, Super Sports or something, which like Barbie Super Sports, I can fuck with. Like, I have no problem with that video game. God, the fight 90s, me. That's 2000s my PC. Were like, oh, that's good shit. But anyway, um, so we're all talking, and I mentioned my period, and uh, my boyfriend's mom chimes in after my boyfriend has to, of course, like say, Jamie's talking about her period. <laughs> and uh, the mom comes in and says, you know, I didn't talk about my period with your dad until we were married. It's like, well, shit, like, uh -huh. <laughs> no wonder this shit is stigmatized, like, yeah, cause no one I can easily find uh, condoms in a drugstore, but, you know. Yeah, and, and like... Well, actually, like, some... backtrack, like, you could probably find an equal amount of condoms and tampons in a drugstore, but, like... There's a reason why you can get a quick dispenser of condoms mm -hmm. in the women's bathroom, but heaven for goddamn bid that we even mention the possibility of having tampons in a bathroom. Right? Because then, because they're seen as, like, I don't know, like, less masculine, but also, like, dirty in some way, and it's like, the the fun the fun thing is they they were originally designed as, like, a way to, you, you shoved it into a bullet hole to uh to absorb the blood from the bullet hole and honestly like oh. what, what is more traditionally masculine than like bullet holes or what the fuck ever and right right but no that but they're seen as like but even like a clean tampon is seen as like this vile thing that if you touch it you catch the girl or something um mm -hmm. and, and and yeah it's it's seen as this like weird I, I hate coming back to the term eldritch again for fear of repetition, but it is. <laughs> but it's seen as like this otherworldly process. Like, oh, what did like? What was H.P. Lovecraft afraid of other than black people? Probably also <laughs> women. <Vaginas>. Yeah. <laughs> he was afraid of women and, and black people. Yep. Um, um, yeah, like it's. So I so mean, it, thank, thanks, H.P. Thanks, Howard. Yep. You fuck. So yeah, vaginas are are the weed of like societal perception towards genitalia. Yeah, but like then you get the the hippie lesbians, you know, those ants that were just quote unquote roommates or whatever. They were roommates. Um, they were roommates. Um, and uh, so you have that like ant who lives with a roommate. Of course, mm. they've they've been roommates for a long time. Um, and they're like hippy dippy. So yeah, vagina as we like sticks in this metaphor. We we love to see Definitely. it. Definitely. Um, uh, what I love about uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer is that lesbianism is so tied to witchcraft. <laughs> uh, still holds up. Love that shit. It gets even worse, and by worse I mean better in the comics. At how deep that metaphor goes. I mean, I it's great. I hung out with uh, with a family of pagans, and like the 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 mom there was like deeply into like witchcraft, and uh, but also um, like tied tied it all to like feminism and how how like lesbianism would be like okay, and, like and how witchcraft kind of empowered people to be like openly lesbian. Uh, because, like, mm -hmm. witches were, like, way back in, like, medieval villages and shit, like, witches were the, the people that you turned to, uh, if your, if your animal was sick or if your, your kid needed, uh, 
like if if you if your your daughter was giving birth that day or or whatever and you needed someone who who knew the lines <laughs> um i'm i'm <laughs> i'm mixing my like different uh medical practitioners of the day but yeah, someone who knew how to how how to birth a child or you know, make sure you yeah, make yeah. sure your your goat was like gonna get better uh, before before the Inquisition came in and fucked that all up. I, I spent a lot of time with pagans and and they that there is definitely a lot of like positivity there that's all kind of tied up in witchcraft and lesbianism there. So uh, like it, it doesn't come from nowhere when Joss Whedon does it. Oh Joss. So cu- coming out to my parents was like a big one. Um, my 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 older brother had already come out. And it was a, and it was in the light of that that I that they had, uh, that that they'd kind of accepted that that I considered it was safe-ish to come out to them. Uh, my wife and I were back in the UK uh, as part of a just a visit. Um, we we had like, uh, we we had either that day or the day before gone out on a on a ghost tour. Uh, and I, tr- and I, I swear to God that this this is tied into it. <laughs> but it, it was the worst, like most boring ghost tour I've ever been on in my life. Because I I I'd been <laughs> on a ghost tour before that was fun. Like we had like a drunken like pub crawl ghost tour where we'd go and like oh hell yeah right, uh, it was in like Door County in Wisconsin. They they did a thing where you could you got your you got your mug that was like sold sold by the uh, sold by the by the tour company. They put you on an old school bus and they would like go from bar to bar and share the ghost stories. God, that sounds lit as hell. But I imagine they also gave you like a wheel of cheese. Like, would you like a wheel of cheese in Wisconsin, uh, but also beer? They, they were actually very cherry centric in Door County. Oh, interesting. E- everything is cherries. I like there. that though. Uh, I love cherries too. Uh, so we were like singing like old school, like classic rock that you'd like it, that evokes like the supernatural. TV show when you think of it. <laughs> so we were like belting these songs out the top of our voice. This was a really boring ass ghost tour. Th- this this like old guy who was carrying a shopping bag. We thought it was going to be part of the tour, but it wasn't. I think he'd just come from doing his shopping. He would take us from like through different places. He would ramble on about uh, about just like the ghosts that were there, and he's like, oh, you know. That there was this one time where someone saw someone at the window or heard a pipe rattling or whatever and there's no other explanation for for that th- and they're like <laughs> do you, I don't think there it is had to be you? ghosts right and and me like I I I am ambiguous I uh, in terms of supernatural as a practicing pagan I I I believe in some way that that like prayer and such can influence the universe but that also the gods are like somewhat very hands off in like that deist way, mm-hmm. but but even I was just like no, there's plenty of other explanations for that. But I didn't want to like talk in the middle of the things. I didn't want to be that guy that heckles the the poor guy. But he would end every encounter with, and that's the situation. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, Bruce Almighty, and that's the way the cookie crumbles. Right, and and he, he and it wasn't in, like a very snappy way that he said it or anything. It was just like an awkward like wrapping up of the the story. But like, and that's the situation. I was like, okay, cool. Uh, I'm I'm bored now. But luckily, I wasn't the only one who who like found it like boring, but also funny. Like we had a good laugh about it when we got home. And then it was either that day or the next day. That I I decided to armor myself in the the colors of my people, and uh, and I, I put on a a pink T-shirt that had uh, garnet on like fusing, and it's got like uh, she's like doing a heart over her gem, and it's got uh, ruby and sapphire like embracing on it, uh, and it was yeah it, it was like a very wholesome gay T-shirt, and we we mm-hmm. we were all at dinner. And I and I, I we we were kind of talking about all sorts of other stuff in between. But I'm like, I told Chelsea beforehand that we were gonna do this, and I was just like, uh, like mom, dad, like I I am, I am also attracted to men. You know, I am bisexual. I like I, I I like women and and also men. 
that that's just kind of a thing that I wanted to share. I, I feel comfortable coming out about this. The weirdness about coming out to your parents is that you don't want to talk about sex with your parents. Yeah. Don't have sex with your parents. But also, you don't want to talk about sex when your parents are listening or have a conversation about your sex life. Right. So how's your sex life? Uh, as Tommy Wiseau says in the room. That's awkward because, you know, it, they they changed your shitty diapers as a child. They don't they don't want to think about you as a sexual being. But, like, right. it's an effort to say, this is who I am. And I... I am trusting you in this moment to accept me for who I am, not because I want to tell you about my sexcapades, but because, like, I'm taking a risk here. I'm afraid that you wouldn't accept the truth about me. Right, and, like, the stra- the um, strangest reaction was from my dad. Uh, he... Wait, I may not... I, th- I think it was my mom. Uh, my, my mom asked me, but you're still married to your wife, right? And... My wife is right there, at the table with us. Like we are, we are holding hands, and everything. Um, and I was just like, "Yeah," <laughs> and c- <laughs> she's right there. Like, I like I'm I'm in my mind, just like reeling and panicking, thinking like, "What did you think we were about to announce our divorce or something?" And I I was just like. My, my brain was just like hitting a dead end like where the hell do I go from here uh, do, do I call them out on this like no that's just gonna make things more awkward and just like I'm like oh god this is it I have to play this card and I was like and that's the situation <laughs> we all just <laughs> we all just fucking lost it and that was how I diffused the situation and we just kind of <laughs> went on about about other stuff and, and, and that was how I came out to my parents oh that's so good and that's the situation yeah and, and now you too are now you two are part of the the crowd that knows that joke um, so if anybody wants to know how to come out to parents that are likely going to be uh, pretty okay with it just conclude it with and that's the situation <laughs> Not to be confused with um, the situation from Jersey Shore, which is the, the name of a, a celebrity. True. The situation. Do you know about Jersey Shore? Not really. Oh, okay. But. We have to have these conversations about, like, Lolo, do you know this American reference? <laughs> I, I know. My, my, my knowledge of references is somewhat scattershot. But, yeah, I, I, I fully admit that my coming out story is not a... Uh, not necessarily indicative of the best way to come out to your parents uh, because my, mine were, I, I had a head start, I was kind of standing on someone else's shoulders mm-hmm. in that respect and I, I, I admit that I cannot necessarily give advice in that respect because I know that not everybody else has that kind of situation with their parents I, I think they were kind of of the the soft bigotry stage of like as long as you don't do it in front of me that's fine um i call it soft bigotry because the the spore of the bigotry is still kind of there um Mm -hmm. even if uh it like passively not actively you're you're still kind of saying that it's not safe to to do these things in some way but yeah um I, i fully admit that that my experience is not necessarily one that everyone can relate to because not everyone is safe to come out to about these issues. Uh, right. Especially in the US where it's like very much a... Uh, and it's definitely much more of a religious issue and the, the religious right is very much more outspoken. The, the UK, it's very much a... Religion is very much more a private thing. Um... You don't really talk about it with people unless, uh, un- unless you, uh, unless you ask, you know, it's, you know, you, you, you do your thing, I'll do mine, you know, we'll go to church, you know, we've got Church of England schools, and, you know, cake or death, mm-hmm. but, but yeah, like, it, it's just not anywhere near as big a thing in, in, in the UK, and, and so, yeah, uh, honestly, all I can really advise is, take the advice of people who have come out uh, in those situations more than mine. Uh, if you don't feel it's safe to come out, don't. 
um, if you if you're in a situation where uh, your if your living situation is dependent on the people that you want that you're considering coming out to, it can wait until you're more dependent and more safe. Right. So, uh, so what was your what was your coming out story, if you have one? What was my my coming out story? Um, so, how how I came to realize there was such a thing um, was, uh, it, and I'm gonna abbreviate too because I think that Lolo as a guest, I I want to give him like as much space as possible to share, especially because like this is my channel, like I can share whatever I want later. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you guys get to know me a little bit more, but, um, as far as my, how I realized I was, I was bi, uh, it took me a long time, um, and this is gonna be stereotypical of, like, I learned I was gay in college. Um, I had crushes on boys in preschool, like, I was thirsty as fuck. I still remember my first crush's name. Like, <laughs> but it's funny how, like, heteronormativity works and, like, we teach young girls that they should feel certain ways about boys and it's it's pretty like socially acceptable to feel certain ways about boys when you're a little girl Compad. but like when i was in middle school i think um i i had crushes on girls that i didn't realize were crushes i just thought i like really wanted to be friends with them and there's like a um a phrase that I learned when I I started talking to more women who were into women, uh, which is, "Do I want to be her or do I want to be on her?" Nice. Um, which which is very much indicative of the kinds of relationships I had with girls that I had crushes on. In terms of like, uh, I wanted to be like them in so many ways, but at the same time, like I liked them. I, I like really <laughs> wanted to be friends with Gal them. Pals. Um, and uh, it was weird, like, one of the first indications, I was at a sleepover, and uh, I was hanging out with one of my close friends at the time, who I, like, definitely, like, had a crush on, but didn't realize I had a crush on her. Um, because that wasn't even on my radar, right? I thought we were just friends. I thought I really liked her as a friend, or I, I really wanted her approval, you know? Because I thought I was, like, a nerd um, who didn't quite fit in and kind of stuck out like a sore thumb, and I was, like, awkward and whatever. I didn't think I was a cool girl like her. It always ended up being that way, where, like, I had the crush on the cool girl. Hmm. Um, and so I uh, basically, um, she and I were talking late into the wee hours of the morning, and um, she said something like, you know, she was talking about all the girls she was into because she was, like, she knew she was bi, and she was, like, openly bi, and she was, like, one of the only bi friends I had when I was in... Um, middle school and into high school um and she said you know but you're just not my type hmm. um or like you know um it's like i would never have a crush on you or something and it was like one of those like she thought i was straight so it was okay to say like but i'm not into oh. you and i thought i was straight so like it was one of those, like, you and I would never work out as a couple because, like, da 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 da, da. Like, it was, like, an unsolicited, let me let, or let me communicate to you that, like, you're not my type because I think you wouldn't be interested in being with a woman. Which is, like, don't do that. Like, <laughs> people who are younger that may listen to this, don't ever tell someone you're not into them because you think they're straight or whatever you think their orientation is. I unsolicited. Because they might not even have all their feelings together at that moment. And it's kind of rude when you're not having a conversation about like, do you like me to say, no, I don't like you. It, it's, it was definitely much more of a minefield <laughs> back then because like it, it wasn't as acceptable. I, I don't think. And as a result, like there, there was a lot of that, like, Oh, I like you. And they're like, Oh, thank you. And like, no, no, I, no, I, I want to, I want to get all, all up in you. And, <laughs> but but you couldn't say that, or could you? you there, there was just no way of knowing if the person that you were attracted to was safe to come out to at that point uh, for, for right, a lot of right. our like formative years. 
Right, right. Or, like, now I've just had this, like, bi friend say to me, like, you know, I'm not... I wouldn't be into someone. I would. I'm into girls, but not girls like you. Mm-hmm. What the What the fuck do I say to that? <laughs> what do you okay. mean? Okay. I just. I think I literally said that too. I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because then you're just like, well, like, are you gonna say, oh, contraire? I too am interested in the vagine. Let me play like, my bisexual and I wasn't trap in the card. <laughs> like exactly. It's like, what do I say? Like, oh, I might have like. Uh, gay gay feelings to kiss you, but you just said you were interested in, to me, in me. Like, I'm not gonna lay my heart out for you to crush it mm. because I know you're gonna. <laughs> they ask you how you are, and you um, just have to say that you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> you're not fine. <laughs> um, it's just the all around me are familiar faces. <laughs> um, so, so that was one of my first realizations where I was insulted at the like. Oh man, but I liked her. Dang, what's wrong with me? Like, God, that aw. must have been. Oof. Oh yeah, and like, uh, she was like smaller, like height wise, and uh, like, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say thinner in the sense that like I wasn't big, but like she was just very slight of figure. Mm. Um, so I definitely, like, in my mind would be like, oh, I'd be the man in that relationship. And that's, like, it's silly, but it's, like, this internalized, again, homophobia of, like, right. I think uh, the way that the, the homophobia that is internalized works, you then start thinking, like, do I have to, like, change my gender identity? Like, what if I'm not butch or, like, whatever? Like, can I date someone who's smaller than me, like, as a wood? It's like, right. oh my god, just, like, let it go. That, have your feelings. Just <laughs> destroy the heteronormativity and then you won't have oh, to man. ask those questions. Let's just destroy capitalism together and then scissor. <laughs> Um. I've, I've, I've had people tell me that destroying capitalism won't destroy homophobia and sexism. Like, it'll be a good fucking start. <laughs> like, you but, can't destroy uh, yeah. one without destroying the other. Yeah, and I, I, I hit the same roadblock when I got into college because there was a girl that was... Um, it was interesting because she was a lesbian, mm. but she confided in me that she had been with men before and that she had liked it, but she like solidly identified as a lesbian because she liked the, the culture better, hmm. um, which is interesting. And I think like, that's why we need to have more conversations about being bi because I think like bi people like <laughs> um, are, are too often shoved into, well, you're basically straight. So right. you're not gay enough to be in the club. Um, which, like, same thing for, like, people who are ace. Like, you can be in the club if you're ace. Right. Um, like, I know, like... You can be in the club if you're straight. Fuck. Like, just crush capitalism with us. God. Absolutely. Like, one of our, one of our friends (laughs) that we know, I won't mention their name here, but, uh, yeah, she, she is bi, and she, uh, well, a while, like, over a year ago now, got pregnant, and she she mm-hmm. announced it to her uh, to her parents, and they said, "Well, you can't possibly be by then." And I'm like, uh, "Steady on, like, <laughs> right, exactly, like, like um, yeah, or you yeah, know, I'm I'm dating a man now, and now my lady feelings are just irrelevant or something, right? Uh, because I'm monogamous, right? Like, and, and yeah, like I, I feel like that we do go through. Like I feel like the stage of like what gender we're attracted to can flux all the time. Like when when I f- when mm-hmm. I first like found those like uh, like attractions to like people of like facing like male gender, I was just like, yes, I would like to explore all of this, please. Just like I uh, <laughs> like when you first find out that you uh, when you're legal drinking age, you're like, yes, I would like to try all of the alcohols, please. Please, please shove all right. of them in my face. And um, I have a weird, like, um, ace story as well that I think, like, someone might find a little helpful. Oh. Um, insofar as, like, sexuality is complicated and everyone's experience is different and, like, again, ace folks are always invited to the table. Hell yeah. Um, because, you know, 
the people will sit there and be like, they don't belong in a sexuality club because they don't have sex. It wasn't about sex to begin with, you fuck. Like, um, like when people are like, why do you have to shove it in my face that y'all are gay? I'm like, it's not about who we're having sex with. It's mm -hmm. about the fact that you ostracize us. Stop it. Right, and, and ace people can um, have sex. And they do. But, yeah, exactly. And that's why we need to talk about it, because there's too many misconceptions. And uh, so I... Uh, that it's a, it's kind of a sad story because I, I know a lot about like the ace community because like I um, I was on steroids for so long because of my chronic illness and that fucked with my hormones a lot and I eventually like inquired because what I said was I I have no libido to my OBGYN and I I felt that uh, I felt very confused in my sexuality when I first started college. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was before I was, was interested in, in a lady. Um, but I, I was very confused because I, I like wasn't feeling attraction the way that other people articulated attraction and I had no libido and I wasn't interested in sex and I was like quite afraid of sex as an experience and I didn't have sex for the first time until I was like 25. Hmm. But that's, you know, another story. Oh yeah. Um, but I, um, I came out as or I, I talked about asexuality with the head of the LGBT office um, at my undergrad institution. And we talked about asexuality. I went to like the ACE website, like uh, I, I felt like seen. And then I went to my OBGYN, I said, I have no libido. And then we talked about like starting birth control because people take birth control even when they aren't having sex, you know, revelations. Hmm. And, uh, so I started birth control and, and lo and behold, like I, I started being able to, to feel things because my testosterone was stupid high. And I also had like um, cysts on my uh, ovaries, on, on the ovaries um, that uh, probably were not helping the situation. So we started birth control to reduce cysts and also to boost libido. Um, and lo and behold, it helped. But I say this not to say that, like, oh, if you're asexual, you should just go to your OBGYN. Uh, no. Just, uh, I think, like, there's a variety of ways to identify, and your identification will, can and will change over time. Yeah. Uh, I think. Um, especially when you're young and, uh, like, when you're trying to figure yourself out and even if you have to say like, okay, like identify as this uh, at the time because it was helpful for mm -hmm. me. Um, again, these labels like don't work as well as we think they do. Um, like gender doesn't work as well. Um, boxes for sexuality don't work as well. Um, you know, race doesn't work as well as we think it does. Um, oh. But at the same time, it brings us to communities that we hope will be accepting of us, and we're trying to make them more accepting every day. Um, but, you know, with, with the libido and stuff, uh, I don't want to say, like, dealt with, but, like, after that sort of saga of getting my hormones in check after, you know, years of chronic illness and, and things of that nature, um, which also affects the way that you see yourself as a sexual being because your body has already been a problem for so long. Uh, but I uh, started talking to this lady who had a crush on me and she identified as a lesbian like really intensely even though she had enjoyed interactions with men um, because again the culture of, of being gay is a thing right. um, you know uh, and sometimes it just feels cooler to say you're a lesbian but you know it, it is what it is like uh, I, I can't police someone's use of language um, an identity um, and, and I don't know how they really feel at the end of the day because people like, uh, uh, you don't know the inner workings of their little brains. And I say little brains with as much respect as I Absolutely. can. Absolutely. Um, and fondness. So I only know the inside of my brain sometimes. I, sometimes I can't tell you what I'm thinking and feeling about the variety of, of intersecting identities we've talked about today, but like, um, yeah, the, there was a, a moment that I was at this this lady's uh, house. She had this cool tree house. Um, and it was a tree house because it was like on, on the top level and it was all wood. And 
um, surrounded by like ivy and shit. And it was like the most stereotypical. Like she had incense burning. She made me tea. Nice. Like we listened to the Arctic monkeys <laughs> and drank red wine and shit. It was like the gayest experience of all time. And it was like the That's, best. That was right? pretty rad. But uh, yeah, like what more could you want? So, um, but. Uh, again, I'm still in the I'm straight, but I like really like her. <laughs> like I'm into her, but I'm straight. But am I straight? But I don't know. Like, what does it mean if I'm a lesbian? Like, <laughs> and I'd never had sex yet. Like, and I was like, well, what what do I do here? Right. Um, I'm stuck. And I remember being in bed with her, as one does when someone's staying the night. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, she said something, and and I was big spoon. Right. She was little spoon. Mm-hmm. And I had this sort of crisis of gender in a lot of ways, again, because I was like, I think I'd always been used to being small compared to dudes. And dudes made me feel small. There, There's something about like the way that we reward women feeling small. Again, this all goes into body image and um, so, so self-esteem for women. Definitely. And I, I think that's... I, I feel like if we go down that tangent, we're going to be here forever as well. We have a lot to talk about. Oh, yeah. We always have a lot to talk about. Exactly. So, like, um, I had this crisis where I was like, oh, God, like, I don't want to be the man in the relationship, which is, like, a fucked up way of thinking about oh, it. Yeah. But, like, our, our brains, just because I thought it doesn't mean it was right. Right. <laughs> um, and also, she said, like, you know, would you want to experiment? Um, and I said, like, I, I, I don't know if I'm. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm gay. And I had this moment, right? And, right, like, how do I know if I'm gay? Oh my god, look at, watch the mummy and tell me how you feel <laughs> about Rachel Vice. But, but at the same time, it's like. Do you want it, just. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> Brendan Fraser. It doesn't have to be like a, an all or nothing thing, but like the idea of like plunging past that border in some way is, is seen as like something that is like something you can't come back from and 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 right do do we have to view it that way like uh, i i feel like it it definitely says something about how uh like that a lot of that is rooted in like our like western christian based like mindset in that like what once you have like partaken like there's like that is like an indelible thing that you have done yeah, this is the not the tree of knowledge, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, um, and you will be banished from the garden, etc. And, and the fruit is a vagina. Right, right, right. And also, I think I didn't want to hurt her yeah. by by being straight and being that like typical like, oh yeah, just another straight girl broke my heart. But also, um, I didn't know, and um, part of me was worried about like that being my first sexual experience to just let somebody down. I also had never been sexual with anybody before, so I was like, Ugh, like, let alone a vagina. What do you do with that? <laughs> like, how are we gonna scissor? Like, <laughs> so we need, we need more sex like there. because the vagina is so stigma. It, it wasn't heroic to go down on her, mm-hmm. is what we're. Doing. <laughs> if you don't know about the the Batman going down, I, I on, do. I, I saw. Uh, I saw like. Was I think Zack Snyder posted something to his uh, Twitter feed that was like a very explicit picture of uh, Batman going down on Catwoman. Right, right. That wasn't heroic because DC wanted. Because DC was saying that it was, um, it would impact their toy sales if that was a thing Batman did. Which, of course, Batman, a billionaire, would be against the only form of ethical consumption under capitalism. <laughs> the only form of ethical consumption under capitalism is eating pussy and or and ass. or dick. If you can get a blowjob from a ghost in Ghostbusters, like I don't think anyone has said that blowjobs are unheroic. <laughs> Which Ghostbusters have you been watching? But what that does happen in Ghostbusters? Dan Aykroyd gets a blowjob from a ghost. I'm gonna have to rewatch this movie, I guess. But do 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 do. Not Busters. <laughs> But essentially, I did not come out to my parents. I was outed. Um, I felt comfortable telling people after a time, after some doing uh, of the reflection, that I did have a crush on her. And 
it was bad because she had she ended up dating someone else um, after I said that I, I wasn't sure if I was interested in women because I had all this confusion, right? And the confusion stage lasts a while. So, you know, that opportunity expired. So I, I did some reflecting, had some thinking. I also had a women in grad school who were very formative and like positively talking about women being bisexual and like not in a fetishy kind of way, but in a like women loving women sort of way. Um, and, and we love to see that. But um, then I posted a meme on Facebook with Dean Winchester on like the like national day of coming out. And uh, I, I come from a very small town where everybody knows each other. And a friend of my mom's literally called up my mom, like within I think ten minutes of posting, probably. Oh, no. um, oh yes. Um, and my mom and I have a very strange relationship. And my dad's very conservative, so um, there were reasons why I did not share with them, but I would feel comfortable sharing that with my entire Facebook because my parents don't have Facebook. Oh, understandable. But, you know, I felt like this was an accepting space and I, I didn't make this long post coming out. I, I in, in Jamie fashion, I was like, let me post a, a meme instead of being being vulnerable in a real way with people that I grew up with because I don't have a great relationship with a lot of those people. Um, like they're not people that I'm emotionally close to in a lot of ways, but there were some people that, I, you know, I were, uh, I was really close with. Um, and I had a lot of like academic relationships, like in terms of like many of my professors were on my Facebook. So I wouldn't have really wanted to go into my sex life with like people that were supervising me, but posting a meme. Yeah, yes. That's, it's with Dean Winchester, bisexual. It's, it's, the, it's the safe um, way that you can, like, just ease it out into, like, the public sphere of imagination. Be like, gays, that, yeah. am I right? Ah, uh, maybe? That, exactly. No, I, that was, that was my, like, and that's the situation. <laughs> <laughs> was that Dean, Chin, Dean Winchester meme? Um, because Dean Winchester's bisexual, fight me. Yes, um, De Destiel is but, kind of, uh, uh well, not even Destiel, Dr. Sexy. Like, that was an arc. Oh like, my god, yeah. There's evidence in the show, Fight Me, that's beyond Castiel. So, anyway. It's guilty pleasure. Um, but, oh, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, a profound, deep and profound bond. Anyway. Um, so I shared that, and then my mom's friend called my mom and said, I just saw on Facebook, J is Jamie by? <laughs> It's okay if she is, but... Is it though? And then my mom calls me and then asks for more info. And I was like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and like, that was the last time we talked about it. Oh, shit. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> like, years ago. So, here's another uh, tidbit from, from some Jamie wisdom. You can think I'm wrong and, and also, you know, challenge me as well. Some people don't deserve to know all of the things that make you great and wonderful because they will treat you like shit and you don't deserve that. If you think that people are going to be stoked about it and treat you right about it, like, share that. Um, if you need confirmation that people love you as much as you think they love you, absolutely. But sometimes people don't deserve the ability to tear you in half. And that's that's sort of where I'm at with with you know yeah. I am reserving the parts of me that I think are great and wonderful um, for the people that that deserve to hear it and yeah no, like uh, I also value sort of the even if it's a false narrative the false narrative uh, of acceptingness and, and closeness that I have with some people in my life and there's some people I don't want to lose for them, like, finding out that I am the way that I am. Um, even if it's a fake narrative, I, I kind of like the way that it was. So, basically, like, I've had to come out to a lot of people in my life that were, like, my friends and um, some people who were close to me. But I never put a lot at stake in those coming outs. Um, and for that, I'm very lucky. Um, 
And again, there's some people I'm not out to and I refuse to be honest um, with my mother because that's not where we were at and I never told my dad. And uh, you know, there, I feel like there's no reason to. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't feel like I deserve to face any sort of like negative judgment. And I feel like my dad and I have a very positive relationship and any sort of homophobia that would um, come out of that interaction is a result of his like awful upbringing in a, in a homophobic society, not necessarily, um, you know, indicative of how much he loves me. Do you know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. And it, it would definitely be uncomfortable for him to have to battle the cognitive dissonance of how he feels with that and like struggle to maybe struggle to like face uh, someone he knows in reality being that way uh, and and you mm -hmm. don't have to be the person that 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 makes him face that struggle right like my my dad can barely handle that that I'm old enough to have sex <laughs> with men you know what I mean like to him I'm still like you know five years right. old and and his little girl because that's just who he is. So to imagine me doing anything with a woman would just be off the table to have that conversation. It's barely on the table that uh, I, I date men. Right. right. <laughs> like, and, and he doesn't want to see me in any capacity above like his yeah, child. We, we, don't, we don't have to be a crusader for our sexuality. Like if, if it puts us in danger or like serious discomfort to have to face these things in our relationships and the society that we're in bottom text then uh then <laughs> we don't we don't have to right right and so i think like we've had some time to talk about our our experiences and our our coming outs and our identities and everything in and around and in between and what have you and insert euphemisms and such um but I guess we should we close out by talking about pride as a thing since it is pride month and I guess like as a, a kitschy conclusion um, yeah yeah so yeah we were discussing like what does pride as an event uh, means to us yeah pride as an event or as a uh, celebration like if we have pride as a month and pride as a thing that in general, we think of um, for for LGBTQIA plus folks, queer folks, mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah, I I feel like it's definitely very important um, as someone who uh, is kind of very very straight passing when they want to be. I don't feel like I have as much of a dog in this fight, so to speak. I don't have mm -hmm. as much skin in the game. Uh, however, I, as uh, as I got older and felt like, um, you know what, I, I do want to explore this more. That it is it is good to to get involved in it. Uh, I've only ever been to one Pride event, and that was um, God, it's a couple of years ago now. Um, and in uh, in North Dakota, we actually have Pride a couple of months later we have it in august uh because we don't want to compete with the minneapolis pride you know uh fargo mm -hmm. is such a small town compared to say to the twin cities of minneapolis that no one would come to a fargo pride if uh uh at the same time as a as minneapolis pride so we actually got to experience it in in august and yeah it was it was nice to it was it was good to see other people out who are just who are just like flying their flag and say like hey it, we are we're out there this is who we are there's no shame in in doing this uh, it's good to find that kind of solidarity and, and and like maybe like buy some merchandise from the local vendors and stuff because mm -hmm. Rain rainbow capitalism is kind of a double edged sword like one yes like rainbow capitalism is bad in the respect that 
most like big companies are only doing it for clout and to like get some exposure and is like yes give give us your gay money you know because it spends it spends <laughs> just as easily you know on the other right. hand we live in a capitalist society bottom text mm -hmm. and the the sign that it, that um the the sign that all of these companies are willing to put out that rainbow flag f one month out of the year is is a good is a good sign that we have gotten to the point where where all of these companies acknowledge that we are people who uh, who are valid people who have money but but are still valid people and so um, it'd be nice if we didn't have to if we didn't have to have rainbow capitalism uh, in the respect that it'd be nice if we didn't have to have capitalism but as long as we do then I suppose the rainbow capitalism is a start and that's kind of, that's kind of right. a conversation that would be nice to have at some point about um, everyone remembers Cyberpunk 2077's Mix It Up Girl uh, like the the woman with the penis, uh, like the the iconic poster that the, you know, she's got the throbbing erection with the um, that that happens. And what are you talking about? Everybody knows about this in Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Who the fuck is everybody? Oh, this is news. Oh, it to was me. it was highly publicized in part of its in its advertising. If you look up, if you oh, look okay. up Cyberpunk Mix It Up ad, um, you'll you'll see the you'll see the okay. poster that. Uh, that everyone is referring to, yeah. So, I will do my best to also add this to to the visuals of this okay. um, podcast. So yeah, type essentially, thing. Um, the the my view on that is kind of the same thing as I, I have with like rainbow capitalism is that like uh, fem feminine people with penises uh, you know, deserve better representation than than this, but in a purely in a capitalist society. The fact that that they are marketable is a sign of acceptance, and like it's we we deserve better. But the fact right. that we have this is a sign that acceptance is changing. Right, and uh, you know, there's a conversation to be said about like queer yes. baiting, um, because queer baiting can be toxic to the LGBT community. But I wonder about its contribution to like heteronormativity or a society that is not accepting of people with non-normative gender or sexuality identities. Uh, or do you remember um, the all the things she said um, music video with the two Ta girls tattoo, kissing? Yeah, yeah tattoo. Um, and that that's queer baiting because they were two straight girls that were paid to make out essentially, or or you know to to insinuate that they were right. lesbians. But, like, how many girls realized, you know, wait, I'm, I'm into women, or it's okay to be into women right. as a result. Or, like, David Bowie profited from saying that he was bi and then later saying, you know, I'm in the closet straight. Like, and I'm not here to say, like, you have to know 100% if you're bi or you can never take it back or, like, you can never change right. your mind. Because of course, like I came out as ace to people, and t takes you backsies. Like I realized some other things about myself, but to say like that David Bowie didn't have an influence in letting people know it was okay to be bi because Ziggy Stardust, this cool ass alien character, was bi and could wear all these cool outfits and like be a rock star who's gonna save the world. Like how fucking cool right. is that? So. Um, even if it is exploitative, I mean, there can be tension there. Both can be true. It's progressive and also exploitative. Yes. Um, it's, it's good in one way and not in another. Um, it's complicated. There's a gray area Definitely. there. Or, you know, other, other examples, um, you know, people, straight people who play gay characters, that sort of thing, where it's like, oh, great, you could have hired a, a gay person to do this. There's not a, a lack of gay actors. Scarlett Johansson playing um, a trans man. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Like, there's a problem there, but it, you know, there's a certain amount of, like, but, uh, you know, we should still think about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, it's not a but, 
It's an and. This was helpful in putting trans men in a level of acceptability where Scarlett Johansson's cast, like Scarlett Johansson's a, a acceptable person for XYZ things. Right. Um, she is fetishized for her beauty um, or she is known for her beauty and you know, acting chops or what have you. She has also said that she could play a tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, oh ScarJo. Mm -hmm. She's made some choices. Um, that's another conversation, but you know, it, it can be both and. It's an improv thing. Both yes. and. So, um, and pride, I think the practice of reminding ourselves that uh, of all the history that came before us like we're doing the the daily work i mean like we like larger communities and societies and like doing the the groundwork at home and stuff like that's an everyday thing but god it's fucking nice to go to a parade sometimes mm -hmm. and i hope that one day it's just so acceptable that we don't have to have the parade it's like women's studies i i do women's studies so that women's studies gets to no longer be a thing because we don't need it anymore because it's absurd to think that you know, we wouldn't hire women or pay women less or, or whatever, like these injustices done to various sorts of people or African-American studies, like, oh. or indigenous studies. Like, I hope that we get to a point where like the representation's just there, but like we need these moments to wake people the fuck up. <laughs> like some people don't remember that indigenous tribes exist. Eventually, hopefully it'll just like, be still studies. Living studies yes so like people say like oh like just don't shove it in my face that you know you're doing x y and z it's like oh my god i turn on the tv and it's like every kiss begins with k and it's a man and a woman yep. like how many fucking times do i have to see men and women doing things romantical or sexual or whatever like you're rubbing it in my face all the time yes straights and i say this as a bisexual lady but like you know what i mean like wake right, wake you up see, like kid like parents will see their son like just talking to like a girl on the playground when they're like three and they'll be like oh look at my little ladies man like you don't fucking you have a little girlfriend yeah. That's, right, exactly. That's the, so it's one of those like it's the, it's, the face oh, shoving is is occurring from you guys. It's called indoctrination. You don't know you're in right. it. Uh, it's it's called being in the matrix. You now know kung fu. Um, if only. So uh, I guess we should wrap up, my friend. It it has been a, a journey we have been on, but we've we've talked about ourselves. But I think in a lot of ways we've wanted to talk about like a lot of things that are on our mind at the moment in terms of why we even do pride. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> but if you have any questions or comments or concerns, as one of my professors used to say, um, please leave them in the comments and I will link to all of Lolo's socials in the description as well. So be sure to check out the description below for all the other shenanigans. But thank you for listening to us ramble and have a good time. Um, and Lola, do you have anything else you'd like to say before we say bye? Um, yeah, thank you for thank you for plugging my uh, my socials. Yeah, Twitch uh, is where I do my streaming. Uh, Twitter is where I will announce my schedules and just put my random late thoughts for relevance and the occasional pathologic meme which is much more popular than I realized um, thanks for having me and that's the situation <laughs> <laughs> have a good one everybody bye, bye.